Hi everybody, Sue here with video podcast number two. Now, last time when I spoke, I was outlining all the plans for May's, our future plans, and one of the things I talked about was having this podcast. Um, so, um, in thinking about the podcast, I was thinking about different ideas that I might like to try out to see what you all think. Um, and some of the ideas have been around maybe me answering some questions that I get asked frequently, Maybe I could have a chat with one of the parents, perhaps, that I've been working with. Uh, maybe I could get a professional to come along and we could talk about a topic together or interview them. So I've got a few different ideas about how the podcast might work. Um, so what I thought for today would be helpful if I perhaps pick one topic that I get asked about an awful lot. So when people come to see me at coffee mornings, um, I get a lot of the same kind of situations cropping up for people that they would like help with. And lots of people contact me also via email and social media to ask for help with particular issues. And there are some very common themes that crop up. So um, today I thought I would pick one of those common themes and just give you a little bit of the way I think about it and some guidelines that could be really helpful for you. Um, and then maybe in future episodes, you could email me with your questions um, and I will either try to answer one or two or three, or maybe just pick with one topic that I can expand in more detail. So let's try this today and let me know what you think um, and then we'll revisit it next time. So the topic that I've been thinking about that I get asked about the most is uh, the issue about school provision for children. So quite often I will have parents coming to see me to say, they're not really quite happy with the provision that their child's school is making to um, take account of their child's needs. Something that crops up really often. Um, and quite often what the parent will say is, um, this is what I notice about my child, this is what I know about my child, my child's got these particular needs, and maybe the school are not seeing it, or maybe what the school is putting in place is not really quite the right thing. And so what I often find is the parent will become increasingly frustrated thinking they're the professionals, they should be telling me what to do, they should be helping me to understand what my child needs and they should be putting the provision in place. So often what, what happens then is we end up with a situation with the parents starting to get frustrated, maybe a little bit angry, um, and then difficulties start to arise between the school and the parent and the communication and the working together. And that obviously is a really big barrier to getting the right provision for your child. Um, so one of the things that I often try to point out to parents, and those of you who know me will know that my background is in teaching, so I've been 30 years a teacher. So I also am a parent, so I feel like I understand both sides of this equation. And what I know for an awful lot of teachers is that there are many people supporting children with additional needs who've maybe had very little experience and maybe little or no training about special educational needs. Now, back in the day when I did my teacher training, um, you could take a degree, which I did, my first degree is in special education needs. That doesn't exist anymore. So quite often teachers are going into the classroom never having been adequately prepared for the challenges that they're going to face. So that's not their fault. You have to be mindful of that when you're going to speak to your child's teacher. Having said that, I know there are so many fantastic teachers out there that do have good knowledge and I love it when I hear pockets of, of good practice and where parents and schools are working together really well. But I would say that my experience is that the majority of the people that come to see me come because they've got a problem with something and then in the majority of cases this is where I hear about the situation with schools not working out well. So what I would say is it's very important first of all for the parents to understand the challenges that the professionals are facing. Now you might say well I don't need to worry about that I'm, my job is to think about my child. Well yes it is but unless you really understand the landscape from the school and the teacher's perspective you will not be able to get the outcomes that you want. So understanding the challenges that professionals face will help you to get the right outcomes for your child. So you have to bear in mind that it might be that the teachers that you're working with maybe don't have much special needs experience or training. Uh, maybe there's not much support for the teachers. 
But what I do know is there's definitely not enough resources in schools. There definitely are not enough hours in the day. There are not enough people. Um, and so those resources are stretched to the max. And I know that schools try really hard to do the best they can with the resources that they've got. And you just have to acknowledge that that's the way it is. But what you can do as a parent is think, OK, what is it that I can do to help them to put in place the support that I need for my child? So that's one issue. The other thing that crops up a lot that I hear is that parents will say, my child comes out of school and they're, you know, they're like a whirling dervish and they're very reactive. They go from calm to rage like that and I didn't see it coming. And when I ring the school and say, what's happened today? My child's all over the place. The school will say, well, no, they've been fine when they were here. So this is also something that's really common. And, and it doesn't mean that either one of you is wrong. It means that you see a different version of the child on that day. So children work, by and large, really hard to comply and do well during the day. And that often means that they're coping with a lot of difficulties inside and they keep it all together because they're trying really hard to please. And then when they get home, is their place where they can show their real feelings. And we're all like that, we all do that. We all put on our game face when we're out and show our best side. When we get home is when we have a little wobble and a few tears and slam a door, whatever else. So that is perfectly natural that it will be that way. But you can't be angry with the professionals or blame them when they haven't seen it. Because what you have to acknowledge is, your child is trying really hard to do the right thing. So that can be a little bit of a barrier in getting the right provision in school for your child where you've got schools not really quite seeing it. So number one rule of thumb to think about is once you've understood the challenges a school are facing, think then about how do you collect evidence about what your child's need is. Now obviously if you've had an assessment with a paediatrician for example or an occupational therapist or a speech and language therapist or a mental health worker or any of the other professionals you might be involved with, if you've had an appointment and you've had an assessment and you've got some feedback from that that clearly states what your child's needs are, obviously that is the most secure and straightforward form of evidence that you can provide to a school. But it might be that you haven't got that far yet. And I always say this to families and parents, to families and schools, is remember that just because a child doesn't have a diagnosis doesn't mean they don't have additional needs. So if that's you, you're in that situation where you can see that your child has differences compared to their peers and you haven't yet got to the point of a thorough assessment, then it will be useful if you can collect evidence yourself about what you see in your child that lets you know something's a little bit different. So it might be that you keep a, a journal um, on a daily basis about what struggles you've faced, what behavioural outbursts there have been, um, what challenges there have been in, in overcoming obstacles, um, any of those kind of difficulties around eating and sleeping, um, difficulties maybe with siblings and getting along, any, any of those kind of issues that you notice. Keep some evidence about it so you've got a record that those things are really happening. Um, and not only does that help evidence when you're going to school that here are the issues that we're really facing and and actually, even though my child is looking like they're coping fine at school, they're masking all of this during the day. This is what really is a problem for them. Not only will it be useful for school, but also when you do get your appointment, for example, with your paediatrician or your mental health worker, and you have that precious allocated period of time that you've been waiting for for so long, you then also have evidence to show them about what's been different and difficult for your child. So... In dealing, going back to the point about how do you get the right provision for your school, the number one will be about understanding the, the, the need for some kind of evidence about showing what your child's needs are and sharing that with other people. Um, so then once you've got some kind of evidence like that, you'll then want to start to think about what is it that helps my child? So I might see that my child has this particular difficulty. So for example, my child doesn't cope well Every Tuesday I notice my child is really struggling to get ready and get out of the door. They're tearful, they're saying they don't want to go to school. And every Tuesday it's a problem. And you might then realise that every Tuesday your child's regular teacher is having their non-contact time to do their planning preparation. And so there's a stand-in for the afternoon or morning. 
Um, and it's this lack of predictability that's causing your child to be distressed. So once you understand that's what the problem is, you can begin to think about, well, what would help my child? So typically in that situation, what would help the child is to know that every Tuesday, my teacher is going to be working on preparing our lessons for the next week. And every Tuesday, um, Mrs. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so will be taking my lesson. And the stand-in teacher has spoken to my teacher and they know that I like to sit in this seat. Um, I like to sit next to this person. I don't like it when the room is noisy and I like to have a list of the tasks I've got to do on my desk in front of me. So if the child is then prepared in advance for that change, knowing what the changes are going to be, that everybody else around will know this is how I need it, then you might find that that helps every Tuesday when you're having these difficulties. Um, so that's a really good way to think about how can I help the school to make the right provision. First of all, identify what the child's needs exactly are as you see them or what evidence you've got and then think about what strategies have I noticed really help um, and quite often parents will be looking for a report or some feedback or guidance from a professional but in actual fact when they get it parents realize they knew those answers all along they always knew that so trust in your own ability trust in your knowledge of your child because although you might have professionals around you that are experts in their own field, there's only one expert on your child and that's you. Um, but the challenge for you is to think about how do I put all this knowledge that I have into a format that can translate into the right provision at school. So um, another example of difficulties that children experience are children who have sensory difficulties. Now, in my experience, this is a huge area where there's not been enough knowledge, not been enough access to services, not been enough support for children. So there are, I think, still many children in school every day with undiagnosed, unrecognised, untreated sensory difficulties. And that means that they are coping with overload every single day. Um, so that might mean that they are struggling with often the level of noise, um, they might be struggling with other people in the crowded environment brushing past them and touching them. They might be struggling with um, the noise of a something particular in the classroom that they don't like. Could be any one of the noise, the smell of the school dinners being prepared. Uh, any one of a number of things they could be struggling to cope with and feeling completely overwhelmed by it. And generally speaking, those children would be coping and coping and coping with that all day. And then when they come out of school, they'll behave as if it's like a bottle of fizzy pop that's been shaken all day long, take the lid off and it's exploding everywhere. So quite often those children will be suppressing or managing coping with those sensory difficulties throughout the day. And those sensory difficulties will manifest themselves also outside of school at home too. In which case it's really useful for you to observe your child and see what are they doing to self-regulate. What is it that they do to try and calm themselves down? So it might be that they're seeking solitude. They want to be on their own for extended periods. They might be, uh, this is very common, getting lost in screen time, wanting to watch YouTube videos over and over again and replaying the same bits. Getting lost in a very predictable game that they like. So screen time really common. But it might be that actually what they're doing to self-regulate are engaging in activities like being very, very active, running around, jumping on the trampoline, those kinds of things. Or maybe even engaging in rough and tumble, very rough behaviour with their siblings or you. Um, or it might be that what they're seeking out is a very deep pressured squeeze or they want you to put the sofa cushions on them and sit on top of them and squash them hard. So actually some of those behaviours that the children are using will be the ways in which they are managing to self-regulate. They'll be using those to bring themselves back down to a calm and comfortable level. And so the most helpful thing you can do is observe them and then notice what they're doing. How do they, how do they bring themselves down again? And the second part of that is when are, when is your child calm? What are they doing? when they're, you can see they're lovely and calm, obviously sometimes it will be around, they're just watching their favourite DVD, or it might be about their calm when they're having a bath, or it, there'll be a number of times when you'll be able to hopefully see that your child is calm, and those are in a way more important than the times when they're not calm. 
because it's using those strategies that the child is already using to self-regulate and using the activities that, that promote that feeling of calm that will help you to help them manage the way that they're feeling when they're overwhelmed and overloaded. So there's just a couple of examples about things you might notice in your child that are indicate that they are struggling or having a challenge. And here are the things you might have observed that they're doing to manage themselves. So, so going back to the school provision then, so hopefully what you will be able to do is get a clear picture about here's what I think my child's needs are, here's what I've noticed really helps them. And then when you go to speak to the school, you are armed with good, clear evidence that you've kept in a sequential way to say, this is what my child's needs are, and this is what we've noticed really, really helps them. Is there any way we could incorporate that within the school day? So it might be making sure that if there is a change to the class timetable, that teacher knows to inform the child there's going to be a change, but here's what's going to be the same. Here are the people that you'll still sit with. It's just going to be slightly different. So giving them the information in advance and allowing them processing time. Um, and it might be about if you're going along saying my child has these and these sensory needs and what we know really helps is when my child gets to carry, carry around some heavy boxes or eat something that's crunchy. So there might be some really simple things that you could ask the school about that could be built into the school's day to your child's timetable that would help and alleviate some of those things. So it might be just letting the teacher know that if that your child needs regular movement breaks. So that might be that the teacher just remembers that your child is the best one to pick to go and run some errands. Um, and maybe the teacher might have lots more errands that they need running that your child can be helpful to go and do. But actually what that does is build in that movement break for them to do that during the day. So that there will be a whole range of things that are quite simple that hopefully the school could implement mindful of there are time that it takes and the resources and all the other issues that they're facing going on. You know, you're trying to help the school. You're going at it thinking, what can I do to help them? How can I understand what challenges they face and yet still get the help that my child needs? Um, so the final part of this thinking about schools is that a lot of people will say to me, yeah, well, it's all very well and good you saying that, but it never happens. And, you know, the school might say they're going to do it and then it doesn't happen. And and I'm getting cross because um, they haven't delivered what they've told me. I mean, I hear that kind of thing a lot. Um, and then I would say that actually what's really helpful is to then get the, the ideas that you've got, the strategies, get them down into some kind of a, maybe a one page profile. Your child might have a one plan, or be part of the one planning process. They might even have an education, health and care plan. But in any event, whatever, format you do or don't have with the school to be able to set some targets that are broken down into manageable chunks that can be that can last over a term so that you evaluate them every term um, and I see lots of one plans one page profiles EHCPs annual reviews I see lots of those that parents bring to show me and I would say that that there's some fantastic practice going on I see some really excellent examples and I'm always really happy about that but I do often see the parents who are not very satisfied with the provision that's made for their child. And when I look at the plans, I can see that they're written with all good intention, but the targets that are on there are way too long term or way too vague. So something like um, that the child will learn to manage strong emotions and reduce outbursts of anger. That's the kind of target that sometimes I have seen on plans but for me that is a long-term outcome that you'd expect to to achieve for a child to achieve that in the long term but that would need to be broken down into so say that's the long-term objective the short-term objective would look like this and maybe the first step would be helping the child to recognize the internal signals that mean I'm starting to feel angry that might be the starting point so making sure that the paperwork that you have, that you've agreed in conjunction with the school, contains targets that you think can be, are realistic that your child might be able to achieve that in, say, a three-month period. Now, we'd all love to think 
that my child's going to stop having meltdowns getting out of the house in the morning or my child's going to um, stop having these angry outbursts and we're going to achieve that in three months time but I think we can all see that that's probably a little bit unrealistic you want that outcome to happen but what we know for our children is you'll need to teach them how to get there and that teaching means breaking it down into smaller steps and that's the part that needs to appear in a very precise way on those termly plans that you have so if you're able to get those targets in a much more specific terminology, in a much more measurable way in that termly plan, then you're much more likely to be able to say at the end of that three month period, yep, yeah, they've, they've achieved that part of it, we just need to amend it a little bit, or they can totally do that now, we're ready for the next stage. Or it might be that they haven't achieved it. And if that's the case, for me personally, my preference is always to think, they didn't achieve it in that three month period. Maybe it's because we set the target a little bit too unrealistically high. Maybe what we need to do is just bring it down a little bit. Because what we know is that children need to experience success. It's no good having targets on there that they never achieve, that just get rolled over plan after plan after plan, year after year. What needs to happen is those targets need to be broken down so that they are small steps, achievable and measurable and can then be reset going into the next period, then everybody can see the progress towards a goal. Um, so that's really my advice around this idea about school provision. If you really feel that you're still struggling to get the right provision after going through some of those steps, then of course it's worthwhile you seeking some support for those meetings, some support to help you and the professionals to come to agreement and get the paperwork and the targets looking right. And there are a number of providers locally um, in Essex that you can look, Google and look around at, um, as I'm sure there are in every local authority. So it might be worth thinking about reaching out to some of those agencies to help you, to help to, to move all of that forward. So there we go. That was today's advice around getting the right provision in school for your child. I hope it was a bit helpful. Maybe you can let me know your experience or your thoughts about this topic, your comments. Um, I'm also really happy to hear from professionals who've maybe got reflections on what I've said today. Um, please do let me know what you think. Um, and then thinking about next time we have a podcast or in one of the future podcast episodes, perhaps you might like to let me know what topic you might like me to cover. Um, as I say, there are a range of common themes that often crop up. And uh, I can maybe see what responses you're sending me and do a sort of a general like I've done today. Or maybe if I have two or three very specific questions from people individually, I can, I can answer those. So if you feel like you'd like to do that, please get in touch. You can either comment in the comment section or you can send me an email, which um, is themaze at btinternet.com. And if you can't remember any of that, have a look on our website. I'll put that in the link. I'll put that link below. Okay, that's it for today. See you all next time. Bye.